pain comes in every size. Cathar Love 146. Well, who doesn't know pain? That's part of the deal for reincarnating on choosing or choosing to reincarnate on planet Earth. I believe there are many other planets where life is more convivial. So the lessons are harder, they say, on Earth, but uh, we can learn at a faster time. But part of the lessons, I'm afraid, uh, requires pain of various types, shapes and sizes. Why I'm s s talking about pain <laughs> is, well, I was under the, the false impression that I, I'd, I'd got, well, I'd not got rid of most of mine, but I, I've dealt with it. Uh, of course, I've had my, my share, my fair share. of pain and ups and downs over the years but I, I well it started uh, in a few months ago I went to it's called the mind body and spirit uh, it's on twice a year in Sydney but I saw this very talented spirit medium I was, I saw a group of about 30 that were there and uh, half an hour each. And I just went and for whatever reason, his, uh, he stood out. But I looked at his uh, resume and it said Melvin and I'm in Sydney. So I thought, oh, well, that's, that's a bit difficult if I, I want to proceed further after this session. Anyway. Uh, I went to see him and uh, it was a highly instructive half hour. He told me about this progression uh, spiritually or mystically in my life. And he said, he went to talk and then, oh, he said, there, there, uh, there's this big man here. I said, oh yeah, he said, he's uh, looks like a warrior type. <laughs> he said, he's got a very scary face. I said, oh, that's Henri de Nabors. Uh, for those of you who know the dialogues and the codex, that, that's Henri de Nabors who, uh, who had the dialogues with Jim. But anyway, he said, uh, he's a big man. I said, yeah. He said, oh, he's, he's a warrior guy. I said, oh yeah. And he said, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, oh, he said, uh, he looked after you. He said, uh, but when you were young, he said, you had him working overtime. I said, well, I, I think I really did. Because I thought that sometimes I, I must have a death wish because I seem to get into these situations. Anyway. So he said, they're, they're telling me not to tell you, he said, but to take you through it. And so they, they he guided me through this uh, of uh, situation of taking one's consciousness and taking it down into one's, between one's solar plexus and the chest deep down inside and then doing these various exercises which I shall pass on to you uh, at a later date and he said there is another guide he said this guide is a seer and he said he's, he's sitting over there he said in the golden light and, and uh, Anyway, when I went into this, we'll call it a guided meditation, if you like, uh, he was this, this seer, and I, I saw him quite very plainly, and he was like in a golden light. Now, very, it was all golden, and, and Nigel said to me, ask him, when he steps into your, uh, into your aura, ask him his name, and I did, and he said, Auric. I said, this is an auric field, that can't be right. Uh, then uh, I said, I was going to ask him again, and I just asked him again. He said, Auric, Auric! He said, Auric! I said, oh, okay, 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 
Auric, okay, well, I thought, good name. It's, it's like in the Golden Glow, and, and Auric is, is, a, is another name for gold. Yeah, so that was okay. And then after him, I, I went to a, a, an Indian palmist. And I like palmist, and I like Indian palmist, because uh, the Indian palmistry, the, those who are, who are adept at it, the acts can be brilliant. And uh, this guy looked at my hands and uh, he not only talked about me, he also talked about my family. He was spot on uh, about the various things about them and, and, and you know, that I've, I'm going to live to a, uh, well, I thought I was a ripe old age, but he said, you're going to live to a, a ripe old age. He said, I mean, a really ripe old age, or old age, really old age. Anyway, that's fine. Also, the fact that I'd be in health and, and I wouldn't see the inside of a hospital. All good news. And then he then carried on and he said, you're, you're moving to another level, but you need to be uh, working this level through your head chakra. And, and then he went on to explain uh, about that. So it was like having one lesson, <laughs> go to another guy, completely different palmist, and then carry on to a second one. So that's been great. So then I... Uh, I was so impressed with uh, Nigel Erhu, N-I-G-E-L-E-R-U, who resides in Melbourne at West Brunswick, West Brunswick. And uh, if you ch check uh, Nigel Erhu uh, and on the uh, on the web, uh, Spirit Medium, Melbourne, uh, you'll pick him up. Yeah, for those who are interested. Uh, and I do thoroughly recommend. I mean, I'd hardly be travelling from Sydney to Melbourne. I mean, that's a on a train. It's a ten-hour journey uh, uh, to see someone. Uh, if I didn't think he was he was brilliant, so I travelled down there. And <laughs> when I went to see Nigel, he said, "You actually travelled all the way from Sydney to Melbourne." He said, uh, "You know, to uh, to see me." He said, "Oh, I'm really uh, pleased about that." So uh, that was okay, and we went over various things, and and it was all very enlightening, and, and he helped me with uh, quite a lot of stuff. But he said, y you do have some blockages uh, that are still sitting there, and I'm going to try and help remove them. What he did was he, he was various parts of the body, the chakras, and then he put his hand, the palm of his hand, it was on my back, and he said, you, you've been to war, and I said, yeah, a few of them, <laughs> three in fact, ah, he said, uh, but he said, there's a friend of yours in an explosion, I said, yeah, my best friend, he was killed with a grenade, and he said, well, he's here right now. And he wants you to be rid of him, like get rid of it, uh, stop carrying him around. Well, I, I thought I had, but evidently it's still sitting in there and I could feel emotion when we're talking about this because he was my best friend and I was in the Korean War. <laughs> and uh, this was 1953. And he was killed and, and it, it really shocked me because I was only a young 18 year old. I didn't know much, came from the bush. And that was really the first person I'd ever known that had died, <laughs> and, and you know, particularly not, not wonderful circumstances. And I went into a bit of a shock, I think, because I, I shut, no, I, I didn't think I did, but I shut down emotionally. And for the next 40 years of my life, I didn't cry. In fact, I didn't think I could cry until one day it all came out and uh, it, was a, it was a psychiatrist up and was had to go and see him because of the army and something or other and then suddenly it just the floodgates broke and I cried now I can cry as good as anybody else uh, but for 40 years I couldn't I just shut down emotionally and then of course so there was this and then and he said but he said you have other traumas from the war 
And I thought, well, yeah, but they're not really, they weren't about me, so I didn't really think about them. But the others, well, I'll just let me, there's, there's three. Uh, two of them were concerning the, the, the Korean War, and one was concerning the Vietnam War. So here I am, uh, you know, I'm on to Gnostic Catharism, which is about unconditional love. But uh, the plain fact is, and that's what I believe in, and, uh, and I think if we did that, uh, we certainly wouldn't be having wars. And uh, wars where the innocent get killed, invariably, and, and the rich get richer. Before World War I, there was only a few millionaires. After World War I, there was something like 300 millionaires. Uh, from after the, before the Vietnam War, there were quite a number of millionaires, but not many billionaires. And after the Vietnam War, there were quite a number of billionaires. So, in war, uh, which is what they're all rackets, one way or the other, the rich get richer, and the poor often get shot, or the innocents, and not necessarily, uh, and often really innocent, the, the young and the old. So I don't have much time for them as a pastime. It's about pain and you know we, we burn ourselves <laughs> some people get wounded uh, some people have accidents some people fall and we all know what pain is but there's also a, an inner pain it's a, that inner pain is when maybe someone we love dies someone in the family a sweetheart and there's there's an inner pain an inner, an inner hurt and, and that, that's, that's also pain. And sometimes that pain is even, even more difficult to deal with than because if we, if we cut ourselves or bruise ourselves or slice ourselves, at least it heals and, and the pain eventually goes away. But that, that internal pain or trauma, that can hang around. And I thought I'd dealt with mine, but obviously I hadn't. And, and so there was two lots in the Korean War and one lot in the in the Vietnam War and I'd just like to to, to tell the stories because uh, in, in a way these people's stories uh, or this this aspect of their stories have, have never been told my best friend his name was Sid Sid Meehan S-I-D Sid and Meehan M-W-H-A-N -E -E we joined on the same day 25th of April 1952 and he was a uh, probably two years older than me, two or three years older than me. And talking about an unfortunate life, he, he was an orphan and he went from one foster home to another. And uh, some, of them, some of the homes that he went to weren't very nice. But he, he had good genes in respect, he was very strong. He was about the same size, a little bit bigger than me, but he had a very solid frame and he was a fabulous boxer. And uh, he was doing really well, but a friend of his had to box in, at a match in Adelaide and they were in Melbourne, both of them were at Melbourne and this, this, for whatever reason he asked Sid, he said look I've got the flu, I can't fight, could you go and fight in my name and at least I'll, I'll get the points and what have you and Sid, uh, big wrong decision, he went and he fought in his friend's name but unfortunately his opponent died and so they had an investigation and uh, didn't, no, nothing happened but he was, uh, Sid was thrown out of boxing, he couldn't box any further. So that was the one single thing that he was, he was good at and it was lost. In the meantime he'd married, he'd had two children, but that didn't work out either. So when I met him in the army, and we both joined on the same day, he uh, He had a wife, and so his money to your family went to his wife. But because he left uh, her, and he was with her, uh, he had a girlfriend, and his girlfriend was looking after his two young children, who were you know, three or four, something like that, very young kids. And so any money he had went to her. So I'm no gambler, but at that time <laughs> I used to gamble every payday, every two weeks, and I was 
doing really well. So there was more than enough money for both Sid and I from, my, from the proceeds of my gambling, which of course was illegal, but that was neither here nor there to young soldiers. And then I, uh, I overstayed my leave before I went to Japan on, to go to Korea, and we had further training in Japan. So Sid arrived over there virtually a month before me. And when I got over there, he'd already organized himself a girlfriend. And a month later, he informs me that his girlfriend in Japan is pregnant. Uh, a few weeks after that, he informed me about that, he was sent off to Korea to three battalion. And our battalion, as people, they didn't normally, but battalions are replaced, but as, but as people got killed, there was just this group in Japan and they just sent us over to replace those people who had been killed. All people had uh, done their year had done their year in Korea and they were sent home so they had replacements coming from Japan. So I, I arrived over there and uh, they said, where do you want to go? And I said, uh, Don Company and the 3 Battalion. And they said, yep, uh, that's where my friend is. And I got there and I'm looking for Sid. And I said, me and where's he? Well, well, we just come out of the, they just come out of the line and they, they were on rest for, for a week or so. And, and I said, where's his tent? And they said, there, over there. And I said, don't, don't go down, why? I said, well, he was, he, was, he, was, he was killed three days ago. And so he had a, he was killed with, with a, a grenade, a grenade explosion. So that rocked me. And but what could you? What could one do? So I, I shut down emotionally and just got on with the job. A few photographs of only a few of him. This is when we joined up. This is this, this particular photograph was taken probably about three to four days uh, before he was killed. The final photograph is his grave in South Korea, which is a, it's a beautiful cemetery. The Australians and a lot of other people uh, uh, don't take their 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 uh, the dead home. They're just buried in the country that they they stayed. I think Australia might have changed its uh, situation on that. And now, uh, what amusing tale about uh, about uh, dying in the English army that if 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 uh, you you are killed. Uh, any money you've got left goes to, to your family, obviously, but they charge a shilling for the blanket to bury you in. That's penny pinching at its worst. So, this is pain, and it's something that I've carried with, and Nigel was giving me the a method of how to he get rid of it. I thought I'd dealt with it, but it was still still sitting there. And he he gave me the system, which I I really appreciated, of how to take it and take it out. And uh, and and also, Sid was there, and he asked that I do this because I believe that when someone dies, and we carry on down here with the grieving and all the rest of it, and they're home and they're happy. But they're, 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 they've got us down here. Uh, we're the problem, not them, not the people that have died. We're the problem down here because we're carrying this grief and trauma with us when they, they would like us to be rid of it so they can move on uh, uh, and, and get on with, their, with uh, their journey in the world of spirit. So that, that was Sid. I mean, if everyone was born with bad luck and had good luck, it was Sid in the end. The other situation was, in the last few days of the war, 
we were under, there was a large battle, they call it the Battle of the Hook. And uh, the Australians lost about 80 men. Uh, the Americans alongside us, they lost, uh, I don't know how many they lost, they lost their fair share. But all these Chinese troops, that we were the enemy uh, 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 facing us at the time, they came up a particular feature which we called Long Finger because it was like my finger, it was just a, like a long slope. And most of them were killed with artillery fire. Uh, and most of them, as I found out, were, were young. There were, there were mature soldiers amongst them, but most of them were just young, 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds. So there's some 2,000 uh, killed. So that, that's, that's, that's war, that's battle. You take your chances. But the thing that got me was, I went over, there's a few photographs, and I had a really good Nikon camera. It was the latest, 1.4. And so, I uh, often couldn't get film. But I took quite a number of photographs uh, the day after the war was over. And one of my jobs was to to go into enemy, enemy territory, unarmed, with a couple of others, and photograph some positions because we thought they had tunnels there. Uh, and I did that, and there were the tunnels and the, the paths leading up to the tunnels. These are the uh, Chinese, the burial party, and uh, gathering all the bodies. The other photograph, or photographs, shows you we're having a cigarette <laughs> when I went behind the lines. Uh, we went about 500, 500 metres, I suppose, before about 200 put their hands up and uh, no, don't come any further. And we turned around and waved and, and went back. But we had a cigarette with these, uh, these, uh, with these um, mainly young, uh, young fellows. And, and, the, and here's the day before uh, at each other's throats. And the day after, we're sitting down having a cigarette. So, uh, day before, uh, at each other's throats. And the day after, we're sitting down having a cigarette. So, uh, there, there's no, you can see that there's no animosity on our side or their side in the main. Amazing photographs, really. Now the thing is, at the bottom of this green finger, this there was a it was before bulldozers, so they had a big road grader, and it literally dug a hole, probably a, a probably thirty feet deep, quite a big hole, and all those two thousand few under or over, over or above that number. All those bodies were placed in the hole and they literally just covered over with, with, uh, with dirt. And that's it. And I often think in Australia, America and different countries, we've got commemorations, we've got various ceremonies, various uh, uh, st statues around the place. But for those 2,000 young kids and, and brave young soldiers, there's nothing, there's nothing I can actually, even now, so it's there, there's still a, a bit of a, a, yeah, there's still, a, still emotion there. And I just think, well, I, I, the point is I often think about that, that those young kids there and, and, and they're just dumped there and they're, 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 they're all uh, mother's sons. Mind you, so much time's gone past uh, that the mothers and sons have been re rejoined in the world of spirit, so which is a good thing. But there must have been a lot of sadness there for those families and the, and the parents of, of those young kids that, got, that, that, that died there. And so I keep, I'm, I'm, I keep being surprised that uh, that, that 
uh, emotion, that trauma is still sitting within me. So that's another story, one to go. Pain comes in all shapes and sizes. The next one was when I was in Vietnam and I was with the Army Intelligence then. Uh, I was the infantry and I was with commandos and then I was with Army engineers and then I ended up with Army Intelligence. So <coughs> there, half our unit were Vietnamese. Translators, uh, all various jobs. And the Vietnamese in that unit, you know, the Australians there were there for a year. They arrived, they did the job, they're there for a year, same with the Americans. And then they went home. But of course, Vietnam being the country, they just stayed on and on. <coughs> so we had, so the thing was the Vietnamese were there for eight and nine years working with the Australians. One particular one, Sergeant Zhu, uh, he was there from the right from the beginning until the end, 12 years, when the Australians first arrived and when they left. Now, to, at the end of the, the, the Vietnam War, and when Saigon was falling, it was, a, it was an obvious conclusion. What happened was, every one of those Vietnamese soldiers and two of them were particularly good friends of mine, uh, Lieutenant Sern and Lieutenant Dan. These are their photographs. Lieutenant uh, Dan is a handsome young Vietnamese. His photo. Uh, here he is with his wife, young wife. Only married a few months. And he was wounded uh, in one of our operations. He was wounded uh, in the foot, luckily. So what happened when Vietnam was falling and the Americans took over 300,000 South Vietnamese, those who could get on the boats, and those who could get out to their, to their ships, uh, some they flew out. The Australians, the Australian government, left them all. The soldiers, in, we had sections and we often had uh, two Vietnamese who were working as scouts and they worked with the Australians going out on patrol, doing all the various jobs. Uh, with me, I had, a, I had an interpreter uh, working with me. There was nurses. There were those who worked in the embassy. Uh, there were all manner of Vietnamese who'd spent time with the Australians and with the Australian government in various positions. Now I have a two-page spread and it was written by the Australian ambassador to Vietnam at the time and he said I kept quiet for 27 years but I can't keep quiet any longer. He said that he had directions from the very top in Australia meeting Prime Minister Gough Whittle and the Foreign Affairs Department that any, and this is two months, three months before Vietnam, before Saigon and Vietnam was falling and they knew it was falling, it was a foregone conclusion. They had a directive that any Vietnamese who wished to come to Australia, apply to come to Australia, had to have the application instead of being processed at the embassy as it normally was, had to go back to Australia for processing which made it impossible to be processed the end effect was, the end effect was, none of the soldiers who had fought with the Australians, not one, came back to Australia. <coughs> no nurses, none of those in the embassy. The, the, the ambassador gave his Mercedes car 
to the driver. He said, it's yours. We left them all. We left them all. Really a nasty stain on Australia. But more importantly, I had these Vietnamese that I worked with and became very close to, and a couple of them, Lieutenant Dan, Lieutenant Sun, and Sergeant Sue, I was very close to and worked, I worked with them, and uh, we became really firm friends. Now, the thing was, I actually <coughs> saw a colonel who was over there, a friend of mine, and he said, if they manage to get to the Australian Embassy, they might have a chance. Well, I, or, I've known since, if they, even if they got to the Australian Embassy, they weren't going to come to Australia anyway. So, what happened? The papers started saying, what about those people who serve with Australians and work with the Australians, what's happening to them over there? So what the Australian government did, they went around and they picked up 60 orphans, just grabbed the babies, <laughs> I don't think they even asked for permission, not the babies could argue, and they brought those babies back here to Australia. And that was the only South Vietnamese of our allies and friends that the Australian government brought back to Australia. And when I think about my really good friends and the fact when the communists took over, they would have got the chop because they're obviously intelligence and uh, the Viet Cong, would, if they, they'd kill anyone who had education, whether they were a doctor or a nurse or a lawyer or a teacher, the first thing they did in the village was these people they killed. So it goes without saying that my friends, I hope they had a, a short, clean death, but it, it could be unlikely, who knows. For years I felt, I felt guilty, I felt impotent, <coughs> couldn't do a thing. Now that often happens with life. And uh, I'm a bit amused because uh, right at this very moment, uh, here's, uh, here's the, uh, the last of ISIS that have fallen in Iraq and it's the Kurds and the, the women and the men and the Kurds and they were the first ones who stopped ISIS and uh, they uh, carried on most of the fight and lost a lot of people. And now, uh, our, uh, Donald saying, uh, oh, we've done our job in Iraq, uh, we've pulled back all our friends. And, uh, but there's the Kurds, all, they, all the Kurds want is a place to call their own that they can feel safe and secure and uh, they could be left in the lurch uh, as well. So who knows what it is. But history has a way of repeating itself. What did they say? Those who ignore the lessons of history are bound to repeat it. So, I'm in the process <laughs> of using uh, the method given to me by Nigel, uh -huh, who, by the way, is half Maori New Zealand and half French. That, that's a fine combination for you. And. I, I, I owe him a lot because one, it's brought to my attention because I I want to clean out any blockages that are in any way that in any way hinder or hamper the uh, <coughs> my spiritual and mystical progression. One other thing that Nigel said and which uh, I thought was interesting and worth passing on, he said when one reads about increasing one's or developing one's spirituality or mysticism, it's what is the best for me? What is in my best interest is often a common phrase. But he said, no, he said, have the highest of intentions, but also ask for the highest guidance, the very best of guidance. Don't limit yourself as far as your spiritual growth is concerned. Not the world we're doing it. Why not? Ask <laughs> for the highest and the best. You still have your guides, but that doesn't mean to say that there aren't other guides and guidance that may be waiting for you. And if you, on that journey, or always ask for the highest within the boundaries of having the highest intentions. 
so pain yeah it's uh, I still got a bit there <laughs> which I didn't realize I had uh, and it seems to me that we seem to spend the first part of our life uh, like we're born uh, babies are not a problem and everything's fine and by the time our parents and, and our culture and our religion and then if you're thrown into some particular war or other uh, or sometimes to society or sometimes if you're you're, you're, you're uh, gay or some other uh, situation that separates you from the mainstream uh, you're going to go through pain you're going to get pain one way or the other uh, possibly a bit more than some others but no one escapes it we all get abused uh, uh, one way or the other, manhandled by fate. And then we seem to spend the latter part of our lives coming to grips with it. And then literally, if we can, literally get it out of our system. Because if we keep it in our system, if we do keep that pain and trauma in our system, it will manifest itself one way or the other. And usually manifesting is <laughs> often it can be cancer or something that's uh, some uh, chronic problem or disease that uh, isn't in our best interest so it's a good thing to be rid of it and uh, the other thing is if you're traveling to Melbourne or you know you're traveling to Melbourne if you feel that you could deal with you could use really uh, honest to goodness spiritual guidance without paying a fortune I do recommend uh, Nigel uh, he is wonderful and he's such a delightful person as well. Pain. <laughs> it comes in all shapes and sizes. Bye for now.